Welcome to another episode of HVAC Talks. This episode is the start of a series on early career experiences in UX. We'll be interviewing various UX professionals to hear about their educational background, paths to UX, career experience, and more. For the first episode, our faculty advisor, Professor Mark Chignall, had a conversation with Dandy Fang, the UX researcher at Thomson Reuters. Hi, Dandy. Uh, it's very nice you can be here today. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your academic background, and, and why you're interested in uh, human factors and UX? Yeah, for, I for sure can. So I graduated in 2017 from my bachelor's with a double major in human biology and art history. And I also have a minor in uh, cell and molecular biology. So as you could see, um, I really came from the science and arts on both sides because U of T being the school it is, I really focus on the breadth of knowledge and expertise you have. And it's not until I got into my master's program, I really, you know, became obsessed with the idea of UX and um, human factors. So I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. So in 2019, I graduated from my master's of information degree with a concentration in user experience design. And given the opportunity, um, I also took some courses in under the MIE faculty, which is a fascinating experience for me and also good for the school, right? like offering four, I believe it's four half credits to for students to really expand and explore, um, you know, different domains and different knowledge in different faculties. So that is my background. And in terms of, you know, like timeline, I really just started, well, mostly stayed in school and did a lot of various internship and pursued different opportunities throughout my education, discovered human factors in my master's course. And immediately I was, I was like, that is really interesting. And despite UX, right? Like it's this new, newer thing, or at least product design is pretty new, but the roots really trace back to human factors, um, you know, industrial engineering and all that. I was really interested in the history of how UX evolved um, you know, over the years. And that really encouraged me to understand the differences between human factors, um, the principles behind it, the cognitive psychology components built into HF, um, and also how does that contrast with UX, which now I think to be a little bit more product design focused. So, you know, from reducing human error, increasing safety to, you know, perhaps nowadays industries were building for the light and user experience. So that's why, you know, that's my background and, you know, how I became interested in human factors and UX. Uh, great. Could you tell us a little bit about your uh, journey, uh, professional journey since you graduated? Yeah, for sure. So I actually want to begin a little further back. So I was really, you know, like pursuing a different career path and how during my master's program, I really thought that, you know, decision-making learning was very interesting and how that was interesting in UX. I wanted to take that further. So um, I pursued a couple of different internship opportunities, both in human factors and also in um, uh, UX specifically. So there is the connection between UX design and also um, UX research. From those experiences, I decided that the best fit for myself would have been in UX research. So after graduating from my master's program, that is the stream I went into. I want to make it very clear to students that there are many different avenues and branch, branches that you can explore within UX. It's a very broad um, discipline. So really depends on your skills. You can capitalize on your strengths and then go into an area that you know, is best fit for you. So my decision was to pursue UX research. I worked for Porter Airlines for two years before making a career, I guess like a job switch to where I am right now. Um, currently I work for Thomson Reuters as a user experience researcher, which much contrasted from my last role at Porter. Um, it is more of a foundation, like I do primarily foundational research and really focus on answering big questions for the organization. Um, yeah, so that is my role today. <laughs> Great. So you've had experience at Porter and also at uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, do you have any um, 
sort of favorite part of the UX design process or the UX research process that uh, you know you're, you're particularly interested in? Uh, for sure. So as I already mentioned, Relic, my role at Porter is very different from my role right now at Thomson Reuters. When I was working for Porter, most of my work centered around evaluative research. So I conducted a lot of usability tests, um, lots of web surveys, intercept studies. So those were more evaluative, trying to gather data quantitatively and suggest me or put meanings to those data. But currently, I think what I realized that what I really gravitate towards is answering those big questions, running foundational research, for example, narrative research, projective research, um, you know, even more to that, like there is like a CI, for example, contextual inquiries, jobs to be done. So I'm really just like really enjoying the process of understanding humans and human behaviors and tying that to products. Yeah. Great. Um, in terms of the process, uh, how can you tell if someone's doing a, a good uh, UX design? Do you have a feeling for you know what is good in UX? I think that question is very layered. I think, first of all, if you think about design thinking, it's a process and there are different stages. I think in each of these steps, you can tell if someone is doing a good job or not doing a good job. So to give you an example, if people haven't really understood the market or the audience, but they're proposing a solution. So that process is actually reversed. You can't come up with a solution before you understand a problem. So good UX to start would have been, you know, really understand your customer's behavior, their psychology, and what they, what they dream of in the future, right? Like, do they dream of having a robot assistant in their home? Is that the vision that people want? Do they want to colonize Mars, right? Like we want to think about what is the ideal world in the future for these customers? So moving down the stream, so moving downstream, so what I think about good UX is really, are we providing the correct solution or a design pattern to allow users to finish their job? So I don't know if everyone is familiar with um, Clay Christensen, um, but I think you know his theory behind jobs to be done is just so innovative. And it's really fundamental as well because everyone is trying to use a tool or a solution to fix a problem they have in their day-to-day. -day. So that you know, if we can deliver a product or solutions that help them to finish their job, um, that is good UX to me. In terms of the product, uh, how, how do you think the quality of UX should be actually measured? Yeah, so I think engineering students really have an advantage in this because you understand experimentation very, very well and you understand hypothesis testing. So you really can't understand good UX or determine what UX, like determine good UX without having a hypothesis and then putting it to test. And in order to test the hypothesis, you set up metrics, right? These could have been task completion rate, time spent on task, um, you know, error rate, et cetera. So these are all of the metrics you can use to measure good UX. And uh, I, I, I guess there are often trade-offs, right, between uh, UX uh, considerations and other requirements like business and marketing and so on. Have you had any experience in your work on you know, dealing with uh, trade-offs or, or finding that there are trade-offs? So that you, yeah. it's not just the UX that counts? Yeah, for sure. So I think the number one constraint, right? Um, given the world that we live in, there's always pressure to achieve and there is always the timeline. So these two things are, <laughs> so it's it's really revealing in the in any organization. So product teams are usually under pressure to achieve something within a certain time frame. So this comes with this is the challenge. And the trade-off is sometimes you just don't have the perfect information to move forward, where you, you, can, you just never have perfect data to provide you with the significance that you're looking for. But what I find really interesting with experimenting and experimentation, doing UX research, is that you can always find a signal or a direction to move forward. And you can always break down your hypothesis into smaller hypotheses and do testing fast, very fast. 
So that would have been, you know, the, where the trade-off. So how to combat that challenge is to break things down to simpler pieces, which once again, engineers are very, very good at, and just test often and move as quickly as you can. Right. And, and then uh, do you think that um, these days uh, human factors and new age skills are enough? Or do you think we need to, you know, as professionals, think about other skills as well? I don't know, like AI, data science, or, you know, just, just generally, um, you know, people, are there other things that people have to know or learn in order to make themselves effective UX professionals? Mm -hmm. So I want to answer this question from an individual perspective. Um, everyone comes with a set of strengths and weaknesses. I do think that everyone has the tendency to expand and that is, you know, a psychology theory, which is self-actualization. But what I think is that you should really market yourself and craft on your strengths um, instead of trying to be an all-rounder. Um, the reason why I say that is because when you start working, you work on a team, um, hiring managers are always hiring for the team. So when they see a need, when they realize that you're really good at something, they will tend to look for resources that complement you know, the, the team and then look for a skill that the team does not have. So instead of becoming an all-rounder, I would you know, advise people to really focus on improving your strength. And you know, data science, for example, would have been a great value add to any teams because I do see um, more teams have qualitative research and not often enough quantitative researchers. Yeah. Can you remember the time? I mean, you mentioned in your, um, you know, background when you decided that you, you know, you were interested in human factors, and then you decided that you wanted to pursue uh, UX. But was was there a moment that triggered it? Do you remember sort of like an experience that made you think, oh, you know, human factors is cool, or you know, UX is cool? Yeah, for sure. I think it goes back to, you know, like decision making and learning, right? Um, when I was in my fourth year of university for undergrad, I was very confused about my future because at that point, I, re I always knew that I'm not the right fit to do a wet lab or sit, sit at the lab bench for a day. Um, it would just bore me to death. So I really spent a long time crafting or like going into arts, thinking that that is going to be my future career until one pivotal moment when I realized that I, co I couldn't deal with the art to business world. So I was just, you know, going to courses, thinking about my future until one day I had a video call with my grandpa. And that was the time, it was probably in 2000, 15, I would say, when WeChat is first becoming a thing. And he had no idea how to use WeChat. He's barely understanding the phone and how it works. And that really started to get me thinking, how can we, or how, how might I enable my grandparents to use video conferencing and enjoying the perks of you know, the new age, the dig digital era, so that we can communicate to each other, share photos, which with each other, I think that was the realizing moment to me. And then telling me that, okay, you can actually create an impact in a whole generation of people's lives um, if you actually can solve this problem. So that's when I really got into human factors and UX design. And ultimately that's what made me apply to my master's program. Right. Do, do you have any advice? I mean, we're talking now to uh, uh students who are going to be graduating soon and contemplating some of them a, a career in UX. Do you have any advice for you know, people coming out of school now, um, what, what they should do, how they should prepare, where, they should, where should they look, that kind of stuff? Yeah, for sure. So once again, right, like I would recommend people to tell their own stories, be individual, be authentic, and just tell people what you are good at. The people who will not see your strengths or don't need the strengths that you have won't hire you anyway. So you can only tell your story, your own story to the best that you can. And in order to make you more competitive, I think it's just reaching out to having connections and then learning from, just read a lot as well. If you don't have um, you know, the guts to just go out there and talk to everybody or talk to the whole world, how about just read more Medium articles, so follow some industry leaders to understand what the market is currently looking for in talent. Do you have that talent? Can you tell your own stories? 
Um, are you confident in your talent? I think that's one thing too. Oftentimes students come out thinking that, oh, I'm just a student. I'm not so confident in my skills. I haven't had an industry experience. Does, that does not matter. You should understand what you are looking for um, and always go according to your plan um, because that's ultimately what is going to work best for you. And I, I really think, you know, like, starting with ourselves and then crafting our own stories the, is the first step to go. Right. You, you mentioned uh, Medium articles, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, because uh, I mean, there is a Journal of Usability Studies and there's a Journal of Human Computer Interaction. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, you know, what, why is Medium the place to look, do you think? And what, what, is, what is so good about, about you know, Medium articles? Um, I, I just say that as a general, like, thing, not saying that like, oh, Medium is the only place to go. It really depends on your interests once again, right? So let's say you're, you, are, you, are in, you feel inspired, you aspire to work for Google. Perhaps you should follow researchers at Google or researchers at Microsoft if you have a different goal. But if your goal is to become an academic researcher in HCI and then having an impact and publish often, perhaps you should be looking for a different sort of resource. So it's really whatever you think your goal is. So that's what I mean. And I definitely learned a lot about, you know, from my own interests and going from my own interests to follow a group of people online. Uh, how, how do you feel about, you know, the first choice that people make? I think some people sort of worry a lot about, you know, finding the right place to start their career. Uh, you started off at Porter, you know, maybe it wasn't, you know, the most ideal place, or maybe it was good, or maybe, you know, if you'd waited another week, you could have put your resume in somewhere else and gone somewhere else, <laughs> you know? Uh, how much pressure do you think there is on people to find the right place versus just, just get some experience and then, and, and then recognize that you'll probably, you know, change employers from time to time? I still think that there are societal pressure from everybody thinking that you have to work for the big four, the big five. But I think once again, right, like realizing what is going to work for you. So I actually had a start, well, I tried to start a startup um, towards the end of my education. And that experience made me realize that I need a good manager who can help me to learn about management. I need to go to a place where people can teach me about how business operates. And out of all of my offers, Porter had what I needed at the moment. It had everything I lacked. And my manager at the time was very committed to training me. And by the time I left, I knew there was a leadership position on the table for me if I stayed. But I really think once again, right, like understanding what you need at that moment, are people patient enough to train you and help you? go on that journey to become someone you want to be down the road, that is what you should go with instead of, you know, I'm going with a name. The comp those companies are not going to run away, no names mentioned, but if you want to work for them, you can work for them in five years, 10 years. Maybe they will come chasing for you, I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think sometimes, you know, people, um, you know, respect you more if you've been somewhere else than if you've grown up with them, right? Because they've seen, they've seen you grow and they remember what you were like on your first day. Whereas sometimes if you come in, you know, you're more attractive because you already have the experience. I think so. But once again, right, like <laughs> everyone's goal is a little different. And um, we all have the tendency or desire to be to achieve our greatest potential. I think that is just natural. Um, but that means that comes in different shapes and different meanings for different people. I'm still trying to figure that, that out for myself along the way as well. What does that really mean, right? So I think life is a marathon. <laughs> it's so cliche, but life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, I'm not the best at it, but I try to tell myself every day, be a little more patient, be the person you want to be first before you can go anywhere. Um, I, th I think that just have been working well for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that advice on being the person you want to be is, is really good. I think a lot of people tie themselves up in knots and try to try to present themselves as somebody else, right? So that they can get the job and advance their career. 
and then eventually there's going to be a time of reckoning, right? Where they suddenly realize they're not, they're not being authentic. They're not being yeah. who they want to be. And, and, and they pay the price, I think. Yeah. Are you like, are people setting you up for success, right? Like on day one to, of joining or are people expecting you to just do the greatest and make no mistake? So I think those are important things to think about, especially when you first graduate. I'm still for, I feel like I will forever be, you know, grateful for my manager when I first started out at Porter. Um, you know, I still can see myself in the future. There will be opportunities for me to go back. Like, I, I think it's a great place to work. Yeah. So, so do you mind me asking you, like, were you in teams or were you like, like the, the, when you're at Porter and now that you're at Thomson Reuters, do they have a sort of user experience team or is it mostly you? Um, when I started out at Porter, I was the only one, but I thought I actually worked pretty far and then showed them the, the, the potential of what you can actually achieve. So I, you know, I helped them to draft the job description after my departure or before, right before my departure. And now the team had, is looking to hire more research analysts. So I think it really is dependent on the quality of what your work. And when you're not just starting out alone, in a department, you have a lot of autonomy and you can actually shape the future or the, the, the shape of the team for the future if that's what you're interested in. So you will definitely get a piece of ownership. Um, right now, I work for Thomson Reuters. Um, so what I'm looking for is the vision and the impact that our team has within the organization. And that comes from the alignment with my team and my, um, you know, our director. So it's a different challenge for sure because we're enterprise and the company is so large it's difficult to project yourself and your results so that's something that i'm trying to do how can i create impact by working with different teams learning about different emerging technologies and integrate those into um, our business and operations yeah Okay, this is the last question, I promise. <laughs> um, so, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, reading articles, um, you know, how, how else do you uh, keep up with the latest developments? I mean, as you know, UX is a pretty fast moving field, and there's lots of new ideas and approaches coming out. And even though the, the tried and true stays there, it seems like there's always these different things, some of them fashion and some of them re real changes, I suppose. How do you keep up with things? Mm -hmm. So, I guess I approach it from like two directions. So one direction is because I work in UX research, perhaps that will be a little different from UX design. Research is good because we rely on foundation and we believe the foundation is good. You can every day come up with a new research method and then just expect it to work, right? Like always go back to your roots, go back to foundation. Your academic education didn't fail you. In fact, it actually prepared you very well for research. So that's your, that is just your toolkit, right? Like that will stay as is. And instead of, well, on the flip side, um, to keep up with the industry, right? Like we, I do look for um, market reports, for example, when is the new trend that's up and coming? How are people using, let's say AI as an example to accelerate business growth or to support customer service? How are people using technologies for, you know, different products and how do people apply? Um, I think those are how I follow um, industry trends and market trends. In terms of the people I follow, um, that will depend on where you want to specialize. Let's say data science is what I want to specialize. I should follow, like you, maybe I should just go on measuring you because that's all they talk about is quantitative UX. If I want to you know, really go into ethnography, perhaps I will follow an anthropologist or ethnographer. So I think it really depends on the individual. Where, you're, where does your interest lie? And once you identify your interest, you will naturally start to look for resources and the people who are the leaders in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's great advice, uh, Dandy. Um, anything else you wanna say? I think that was a pretty good discussion. Yeah, I think... I'm trying to get myself and get others to just feel a little bit more inspired, given you know the current environment we're in with the pandemic, with the constant pressure that we feel. Sometimes that can get a little tense. Take care of ourselves, 
um, you know, like just go with your heart and control, do whatever you can. And then the rest of the, the things will just figure themselves out. That's my last comment. Yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Deal with the whole person. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure that people get a lot out of this. Thank you again to Dandy for being on the podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode and stay tuned for more episodes in our series on early career experiences in UX.